This week, we're picking up on our Microtech router series. I'll show you how to upgrade your router firmware, how to assign static IP addresses through your DHCP server, and how to route DNS traffic to your Pi hole by default. Becca's got your top news stories, including a 10 year time lapse of the sun, Tim Horton's under fire for spying on you through their app, and the world's most powerful supercomputer is powered by ARM processors. Someone hacked a half a million dollars in crypto yet Bitcoin is still more secure than gold. Robert Koenig is here to help us figure out the crazy cryptocurrency market. This is all coming up, so strap in. It's time for the tech. Our live recordings are trusted only to solid state drives by Kingston Technology. Revive your computer with improved performance and reliability over traditional hard drives with Kingston SSDs. Category 5 TV streams live with Telestream Wirecast and Nimble Streamer. Tune in every week on Roku, Kodi, and other HLS video players. For local showtimes, visit category5.tv. Welcome back to the show, everybody. It's great to have you here. Nice to have you joining our live broadcast, or maybe you're watching this on demand after the fact. However you're watching, give us a thumbs up. Give us a subscribe if you're watching on YouTube. Um, of course, if you click on subscribe on our YouTube channel, unfortunately, that bumps our numbers up. And as our numbers go up, I'm honor bound to do crazy things. So I had my first choreography lesson. Thank you very much. And it, it, it will say it's, uh, I'm learning. I'm, I'm going to progress as we go. So we hit and surpassed 25,000 subscribers at linuxtechshow.com. And of course, that means I got to do a funky dance for you. And so I'm working on it. And I got my choreographer helping me out with that. And it's a surprise who's going to be helping with that. So make sure you keep watching Category 5 TV. And it helps if you're a subscriber, because then you're going to get the notification. Checking out our Discord, uh, Noman5 is wondering if I got to spend the day at the Category 5 TV studio, being that today is Happy Canada Day. Um, and if I did get to spend some time at the studio today, was I able to dig through the boxes and find my soldering tools? And to that I say, oh yes, my friend, yes, I did find my soldering stuff. But it's not quite set up perfectly yet. It's a bit of a mess. And I'm trying to figure out, like, how can I set up a table? I gotta get a proper table. But it's here. So we're going to be able to get that laptop up and going uh, over the course of the next couple of weeks whenever I get a chance to do that. Did I get to spend the whole day at the studio? Not quite, but uh, that's because I took a, a nice long extended holiday with my family, went up, up to the cottage, and uh, my first day back was Tuesday. So that meant actually doing some of the post-production on Category 5's show from last week on Tuesday. So, um, so we just got the news up and everything Tuesday night and a couple of the other features. And today was spent like writing the news and getting everything ready for you. There's a lot that goes in to broadcasting Category 5 technology TV. And I, I, I really appreciate the support of our community coming together and saying, wow, like I recognize that this is a lot of work, especially um, in these times where I can't have anyone else in the studio with me physically at the same time that I'm here broadcasting. So, so it really, a lot of it falls on my shoulders and it's got to be done. I've got to be able to bring you a show each and every week. But to those of you who have said, yeah, I'm going to step up and say, yeah, I, I appreciate what you're doing and I'm going to financially back that. I just want to say thanks. In particular, I want to say a big thank you to BP9, Scott Barkley, Ron Morissette, Jerry Kowalski, Jonathan Garby, Jens Nissen, Ameridroid, Noman5, Bill Marshall, and NICAD. Uh, plus, of course, everyone else who has supported the show or is supporting the show, maybe through uh, through our Patreon at patreon.com slash category five. 
that's a really cool way to support Category 5 TV. And incidentally, you get behind the scenes access, you get my vlog, which nobody else gets to see. And so you get to see some of the things as they're happening here at the studio and things that are going on in my world as I'm kind of ramping things up for Category 5 each and every week. Um, so big thanks to everyone who is or has supported Category 5 TV. That regular contribution, I mean, if you can believe it, it is now July 1st already. And I keep saying, like, time is flying, but July 1st means, okay, I, I can't forget before I wrap up for tonight, I got to write a rent check. I got to go cover that. So um, those monthly um, contributions through Patreon and, and other ways that you may support us through our website, uh, we've got a few different ways there. You can check it out at category5.tv. But Patreon in particular is a nice way for me to be able to kind of keep track of what's going to be coming in each and every month. And it helps us to cover those month to month expenses. So that is really, really cool. Thank you, everybody. All right, so um, first of all, let's kick things off with part six of our MicroTix series as exploits. Uh, and I should say there is construction going out in the hallway um, today. And so if you hear some noise, I, uh, forgive me, that's, there's nothing that I can really do about that. But uh, hopefully they won't be going too loud and too long. But um, as exploits are uh, monitored and patched, and as new features are added to Microtix firmware, you can easily update your Microtix router with just a couple of mouse clicks in WebFig. And you can see what I've actually, what I've got here is WebFig, I'm gonna click on Quick Set, and then scroll down here to check for updates. Could it be that simple? And you can see I'm running 6.4, 2.12 stable, you can change the branch if you want or the channel, uh, but I want to get the stable 6.47. And if you look below, uh, you can see the change logs for that and everything that this is going to give me. So just click download and install and look at this. Nothing to it. It grabs the file off of their server, downloads it, reboots. So now my router is rebooting. And look at that, 6.47 stable is the version I'm now running. Click on check for updates and you'll see uh, I'm running that version and system is already up to date. That is all there is to it. So your Microtech router is now running the latest and greatest firmware. Next in our Microtech series is how to assign a static IP address to a device in your DHCP, in your DHCP pool. So I'm going to just sign into uh, WebFig here on my laptop. And I want to show you how easy this is to do. So click on IP and click on DHCP server and click on leases. This is an important thing to do because you're, you're going to need to have static IP addressing on your network for things like servers. Um, in my case, um, we're also looking at Pi-hole, for example. So my Pi-hole server is in fact set as 10.0.0.2. That is a static reservation in my DHCP pool for, um, on my Microtech. So any of these devices, so these ones are dynamic. See these? Dynamic. D. The ones that, are, that have a D button, that button will actually convert it to dynamic, but they are currently static. So let's look at, uh, I've got a, uh, let's grab my phone. There's my Poco phone. So I'm just going to click on that, and it's currently assigned to 10.0.0.107. So I'm just simply going to press Make Static. And now it has been assigned to 10.0.0.107 static. But if I close that, now you'll see 107 has that D next to it and no longer is it dynamic. So now if I open it by single clicking on it, I get all these new options. And now I can assign it its own IP address, something that is not currently in use on my pool. So I can assign that to .88 and hit OK. And now my Poco phone is 10.0.0.88. There it is. See how easy it is to configure a, a static reservation on your DHCP pool on a Microtech device? It's fantastic. We've got to take a quick break. When we return, we're going to learn how to direct the DHCP traffic on our network 
to our, um, uh, through our MicroTik router to our DNS server, which is, in my case, a pie hole. Stick around. Question in our Discord from the Foo, who's asking, shouldn't reserved IPs be outside of the DHCP pool's dynamic range? And while technically true in, an, in a different type of scenario where you're not using DHCP, that's not the case here. I'm going to explain why. So traditionally, us sysadmins are basically it's it's ingrained in our minds to always assign the DHC uh, the static address outside of the pool. The reason for that is if you let's say you install a new printer on a network and you go to that printer and you type in the IP address and you put it within the pool. Now your DHCP server doesn't even know that it exists because it did not assign the IP address. So what we're doing here is completely different. What we're doing is we're setting the reservation in the DHCP server, so that printer is still just getting the IP address from the DHCP server. So does it have to be outside of the pool now? No. The reason it would have to be if I was typing it in manually onto the printer is because when the DHCP server then assigns that IP address to another device on your network, it's going to cause an IP collision conflict. So you're going to have two devices sharing the same IP uh, address, and you're going to get all kinds of like ARP attacks warning, uh, ARP attack warnings, things like that, because you've got these collisions occurring within your network. Things are going to go slow all of a sudden. That's a problem. Because I am assigning my IP address from the DHCP server to my device or to my printer, I can set it to anything that is not already assigned. And it will dish it out through the DHCP, and it doesn't matter whether it's within the pool or not. All right, so as we're here to learn about how to configure MicroTik routers, I'm going to assume that you already know what a pie hole is. I'm not going to get into that. Uh, I'm going to assume that you've already got one set up. If you've got no idea what a pie hole is, just keep in mind that in order to do what we're about to do, you're going to need to have one. While it may sound like something offensive, it's actually a single board computer or even a virtual machine that runs on your network 24-7. It acts as your DNS server for your network. It filters out ads at the DNS level. So since the ad never downloads, your internet becomes perceptibly, perceptibly faster, um, your data usage is reduced a surprising amount, and you see a notable reduction in the number of advertisements that you're subjected to. Now, it can have a downside sometimes, such as if you're browsing Amazon. Sometimes they'll present you with a, a relevant uh, product suggestion, but when you click on it, it's going to get blocked because it's an ad. But all in all, this is a fantastic solution that cuts ads way down on your entire network. You don't have to install software on your devices, and there's no configuration on a device-to-device -device level. As soon as your device is connected to the network, it gains the filtering capabilities of your Pi Hole. So if you are unfamiliar with Pi Hole at this point, or otherwise if you don't have one, I did a tutorial last year that walks you through the basic setup. For those of you who are watching on YouTube or through our website at category5.tv, you can simply click that icon to see the tutorial. Otherwise, head on over to our website, category5.tv, and just do a quick search for Pi Hole, and it's spelt just like you see on the screen there, Pi Dash Hole. The video you're looking for is called Block Ads and Porn Using a Single Board Computer. I'll wait. So now that you've apparently got your pie hole all set up, 
let's see how to configure this on our MicroTik router. So on my network, my Pi Hole device is at 10.0.0.2. Your DNS server obviously has to have a static IP address within your network. So that's the IP address that I'm going to be routing my DNS traffic to. So I want to show you a couple things here in WebFig. So I'm going to click on IP, which is already open, and then DNS. So when I go in there, you're going to see the dynamic servers that my network is currently dishing out to all my devices through DHCP. Well, I want to change that. I want to actually set these to be my Pi hole, but you notice I can't actually change those. It doesn't allow me to make any changes here. So first, what I have to do is click on DHCP client, click on your Ether1 in my case, which is, uh, you'll remember from earlier in our MicroTik series, um, the Ether1 interface is my internet connection. So that's the actual connection to the router, uh, from the router to the modem um, to give me my internet connectivity. So I'm going to click on that. And I'm going to turn off use peer DNS. So basically I'm saying I don't want to use the DNS that's given to me by my ISP and hit OK. Now when I go to, whoop, when I go to DNS, you'll see now dynamic servers are gone. There's nothing there. And presumably, unless it's cached, if I try to go somewhere, it's just going to time out because right now I do not have any DNS servers. So now I need to add my own. 10, whoop, 10.0.0.2, and then hit apply. It's done. That's all there is to it, um, in a manner of speaking. But I'm going to reverse that. So we've gone through that process just to show you. I'm going to just kind of, I'm going to reverse that so that I can show you a demonstration of what we're actually, what we're performing here, what we're actually achieving. So let's turn back on our peer DNS. I have trouble with these trackpads. I should get a mouse. Okay, so see, we're back on the dynamic. So I'm going to bring up a website, and you're going to need to do this within Firefox or Chrome. Don't do it in Brave, because Brave obviously already blocks advertising, uh, advertisements. Um, don't do it in a, a, a browser that has an ad blocking tool installed and actively working because it's not going to actually show you um, the, the, the success of doing what we're about to do by routing through our pie hole. So what I want to do is go to https colon slash slash ads dash blocker dot com. And the reason I want to go there is because it's just an ad heavy demonstration website. So if you scroll down a little ways, you're going to start to see some advertising here on this website there are ads that come up uh, on this site. It looks like Firefox is actually already blocking some. Uh, so I'm going again, uBlock Origin, request blocked, seven or 10% of this page. Can I turn that off? Is that what's doing it? Yeah, now we're gonna see ads. There you go. So Firefox is now including an ad blocker, that's cool. Um, but understand, so, well, if Firefox already has an ad blocker, why do we need to go to all this work? Why do we need a pie hole? Remember how I said this does the ad blocking at the DNS level. So, uh, and I hinted to the fact that you're going to reduce your bandwidth consumption, you're going to speed up your internet, and that is because with something like an ad blocking plugin or an ad blocking browser, traditionally what happens is, is it still downloads the ad, it just hides it. It blocks it. But with the DNS level blocking, it, it's actually the request to the ad servers that respond with an, a null response. So it's actually blocking the ability for your computer to reach the ad server at all. It can't download anything. They can't track you. They can't trace that request. It doesn't matter. They're, it's going to be blocked at the DNS level. So there's so much more to it. So now that I've got this uBlock disabled, you can see there's a Google ad right here. Okay. So back over to my micro tick here. Let's again go to DHCP client under IP. And there are many ways to do this. You can do this on a, a network by network basis if you want, but I'm just going to do this on my entire network uh, because I want any device that is on my network to go through the pie hole. I'm going to turn off use peer DNS and hit OK. Now go to DNS and add my pie hole. 
10.0.0.2. And this is all quite instantaneous. However, uh, there are a couple of things to note. So I'm going to clear my cache. This is DNS cache, flush cache. So now anything that has already been accessed is flushed out of the DNS cache. And so it's not going to be, um, it's, it's going to request it again and go through the pie hole. Um, the other thing to keep in mind is you could, if you wanted to, go into DHCP server networks. So instead of doing this at DNS, I could just say, okay, my LAN or my, these are my um, guest Wi-Fi networks. Um, I could just add a, a, a specific DNS server for those. So I could do that. See how um, diverse the configuration can be with a micro tick? So by doing it that way, you could have multiple pie holes with multiple different settings. You could have a mom and dad Wi-Fi that has, that has direct access through like Google's DNS or something like that if you don't want to block things. Um, you can have um, your guest Wi-Fi have a more hardened uh, DNS filter, for example. So you can do that at a, at a network level. In my case, as I say, I'm not doing it at this level. I'm doing it on my full network. So my Ether1 um, is going to go through 10.0.0.2 for all of its DNS requests. So now, if I jump over here and just refresh this page, as simple as that, the advertisement is blocked. See that? So it tried to load it. See how it's got a placeholder? It tried to access the ad, but it was blocked at the DNS level, so it never got to my browser. How cool is that? So with this setup, another thing to keep in mind is that while your Microtech DHCP server is um, is going to dish out this new DNS setting for 10.0.0.2 in my case. You may have uh, a situation where somebody has maybe a custom DNS setting on their phone. Or maybe there is, uh, they're, they're running a browser that overrides your network's DNS settings. That could be a problem because this setting is not enforced. So this setting can easily be bypassed by your device. So by default, your Microtik device right now, as I've just demonstrated with this basic configuration, is going to download um, those settings through DHCP. I don't know that download is the right term, but it's going to get the new IP and DNS settings from your DHCP server on the Microtik. But if your device has its own custom settings, it's going to circumvent that. So if you'd like to instead enforce it so that even if there was an override on a device or if your browser was ignoring your desired DNS settings on your network, well, you'll want to watch further in our series as we're going to be looking at how to do what's called DNS masquerading. And with DNS masquerading, we're going to take what we learned today on this tutorial and we're going to take it to the next level, which is to say, okay, my micro tick is now going to basically find any DNS traffic that's going through my network and it's going to masquerade it so that it has to go through the pie hole. There is uh, an inability on your device to circumvent or override that. Even if you set your, uh, your DNS settings manually, masquerading will force it to go through, in my case, 10.0.0.2. So this series, cat5.tv slash microtick, is covering a wide gamut of how to set up and configure and use your microtick routing device. Um, this is uh, we're going to be looking more at masquerading in the future. So I'm, I'm dropping that keyword for you because I want you to watch for it. If that's of interest to you, you want to enforce it, get onto cat5.tv slash microtick and look for that one called DNS masquerading. All right, we've got to head over to the newsroom. Becca is here with us. Here's what's coming up in the Category 5.tv newsroom. NASA made an incredible 10-year time-lapse of the sun's fiery rotation. Tim Hortons is facing a class action lawsuit over app location tracking. Disney has been developing incredibly lifelike deep fake technology. 
Japan's ARM-based Fugaku is now the world's fastest supercomputer. Apple-backed firm aims for one million robo-taxis. And Facebook has developed a new set of VR glasses that look like a chunky pair of sunglasses. Stick around, the full details and this week's Crypto Corner are coming up. This is the Category 5.TV Newsroom, covering the week's top tech stories with a slight Linux bias. From the newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. You shouldn't stare at the sun, it's dangerous. But this month marks a full decade of NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory doing the staring at the sun for us. It's been studying the star closest to Earth nonstop from orbit, gathering 425 million high-resolution images since June 2010. The data collected has helped scientists make many discoveries. But for those of us scrolling the Internet for some kind of good news, NASA has turned the observations into something fun. NASA has compiled the images into a stunning time-lapse of the star's activity over the last 10 years. The time-lapse assembles images taken at an extreme ultraviolet wavelength that shows the sun's outermost atmospheric layer, the corona. The movie compiles a photo every hour with dark slides caused by the Earth or the moon eclipsing the observatory as they pass between the spacecraft and the sun. The full video lasts 61 minutes, showcasing the sun's 11-year solar cycle with its rise and fall in activity. The shift in solar activity can be clearly seen as the number of swelling solar spots increase to explosive levels with violent whips of magnetic field lines and solar flares. It then calms down again to a period known as solar minimum, when the amount of solar activity is relatively low. That's a period we're in now, with one result being that the northern lights are less frequently seen in lower latitudes. It's stunning to see from our perspective even if a decade is a little more than a blip in the life of a star. The full time-lapse video in 4K resolution can be viewed at cat5.tv slash sun. Tim Hortons is facing a class action lawsuit in Quebec over data collection issues in the company's mobile ordering app, filed a day after four privacy watchdogs announced a joint investigation into the company's overreach. The court application filed by two Montreal-based law firms on Tuesday cites an investigative story by the Financial Post which revealed the Tim Hortons app was logging users' location data in the background even when the app wasn't open. The app was streaming GPS location data to Radar Labs Inc., an American company which analyzes location data to infer where users live and work and logs a person's visits to one of Tim Hortons' competitors, such as Starbucks or McDonald's Corp. Immediately after privacy commissioners for the federal government, um, Quebec, Alberta and British Columbia announced their joint investigation on Monday. Tim Hortons said in a statement that it has discontinued its practice of tracking users' location when the app is not open. The lead plaintiff is a Montreal resident who works in the IT sector. And even though defined by his lawyer as a tech-savvy guy, he was shocked to find out how the app was tracking him. Consumer protection lawyer Joey Zucrin said that simply stopping the practice of background location tracking isn't enough, because Tim Horton's parent company appears to have been tracking the lead plaintiff since last year, and the damage is already done. Zucrin says they've gained a valuable database of information and behavior patterns and activities of individuals. So are they now just going to throw that out or are they going to profit from it? My guess, my guess is the latter. Tim Horton's Chief Corporate Officer Duncan Fulton, Fulton said in an emailed statement the company did not have any comment on the class action lawsuit and reiterated that it had discontinued background location tracking, although the app may still record user location when it's open. In many cases of privacy violations, it's difficult to sue because litigants can't put a dollar value on the harm they have suffered. But the Quebec Charter of Rights and Freedoms makes privacy a protected right, and that simplifies the case. Most privacy and data cases in Canada have been focused on breaches where companies allowed private information to be leaked or stolen by hackers. But litigation around issues relating to data and privacy could become more common depending on how the courts respond in this case and future cases. 
A new paper published by Disney Research describes a fully automated neural network-based method for swapping faces in photos and videos, the first method that results in high-resolution results of sufficient quality to be used in film and TV. The researchers specifically intend this tech for use in replacing an, an existing actor's performance with a substitute actor's face, for instance, when de-aging or increasing the age of someone or potentially when portraying an actor who has passed away. They also suggest it could be used for replacing the faces of stunt doubles in cases where the conditions of a scene call for them to be used. This method is unique from other approaches in a number of ways, including that any face used in the set can be swapped with any recorded performance, making it possible to relatively easily re-image the actors on demand. The other is that it recreates contrast and lighting conditions to ensure the actor looks like they are actually present in the same conditions as the scene. You can check out the results for yourself in this video. As you can see, there's still a hint of uncanny valley going on here, but the researchers acknowledge that in their paper, calling this a major step toward photorealistic face swapping that can successfully bridge the uncanny valley. It is still a lot more realistic than other attempts, which is especially apparent when you've seen the side-by-side -side comparisons with other techniques. Most notably, it works at much higher resolution, which is key for actual entertainment industry use. Considering the example of using this technique for a stunt double, the realis realism could come across as being incredibly realistic. The examples presented are a super small sample, so it remains to be seen how broadly this can be applied. The subjects used appear to be primarily white, for instance. Also, there's always the question of the ethical implication of any use of face swapping technology, especially in video, as it could be used to fabricate credible video or photographic evidence of something that didn't actually happen. Given, however, that the technology is now in development from multiple quarters, it's essentially long past the time for debate about the ethics of its development and exploration. Instead, it's welcome that organizations like Disney Research are following the academic path and sharing the results of their work so that others concerned about its potential malicious, malicious use can determine ways to flag, identify, and protect against any bad actors. Japan's ARM-based Fugaku is now the world's fastest supercomputer. An Apple-backed firm aims at one million robo-taxis, and Facebook has developed a new set of VR glasses that look like a chunky pair of sunglasses. Becca has these stories coming up, plus Robert's here with the Crypto Corner. Don't go anywhere. Welcome to the Crypto Corner, and again we've got a fully loaded program for you. So let's dive into it. If we look into the market, then you'll see that there has been a slight drop between last week and this week from 277 billion to 263 billion. Uh, an average around 5% drop between last week and this week. Uh, if we saw this here by seven days, then last week we had 20 coins that gained more than 15%. This time it's a mere six coins. And uh, on the downside, last week we had two coins that lost more than 15%. This time it's a few more than that. So it's slightly bearish behavior in the market. And if we look into the DeFi market, um, then similar picture there from 6.7 billion down to 6.1 billion uh, drop between last week and this week. Now, as you remember, last week we went into detail uh, in regards to the DeFi market, how to participate in this market uh, and how the future looks like but also that there are risks attached to that because it's a very young market. And so this is what happened between last week and this week. A hacker stole around half a million uh, US dollars. Now it's not stealing in the traditional sense where you just take something, it's just that they made use of these different protocols in a way that uh, they were able to harvest uh, around half a million US dollars. And the way that worked is, uh, as you remember, this is one of those platforms where you can participate. And so you, they use the uh, balancer pool, the balancer platform in one of those pools. And um, they use the flash loan technology. So with this technology, which means a flash loan is something that happens between two blocks. So it's never registered. So you can take a loan as high as you want. Doesn't matter because it's never registered. But 
between two those two blocks you can do whatever you want to do uh you can do whatever you want to with that money and that's what they did so they took out the, that loan and then they started swapping between the ethereum and the sta token uh, and they did that 24 times until the whole pool was uh, drained again that's between two blocks so it is never registered but they were making use of that and every time that this uh, transfer happened a transfer fee of 1% was charged to the recipient, but that was not registered on the balancer platform. And so every time the attacker swapped uh, between those two coins, uh, those two tokens, the balancer pool received 1% less STA than uh, was expected, and these people were harvesting that. So uh, it shows how young this industry is, but also how interesting it is. And uh, um, as I encouraged you last week, just uh, go in there and learn more about it. Now, on the other side, looking at the traditional market, something similar happened. Uh, 2.8 billion US dollars were scammed in the gold market. Now, that's something that would never have, be able to happen in the Bitcoin uh, or the crypto market, especially Bitcoin, because it's the most secure platform in the world. Uh, but in gold, everybody who operates with certificates, so not the physical gold. It's a certificate that's being transferred. And that's where the scam happened. Uh, with Bitcoin, that would have never happened because Bitcoin was never hacked. Uh, so it's the most secure um, uh, software platform in the world. Now, um, something interesting is somebody published a report um, that is fantastic. I encourage you to take a look at it. And as usual, I put the link into the description. But this report is in depth and very scientific and fantastic. I love this report. So uh, these they go into every single aspect of, of the market. So adoption rate, uh, uh, tax evasion, uh, remittance, and that on a global basis. And uh, they also look into uh, how the value is going to perform uh, from Bitcoin, Ethereum, Ripple, and XRP. Uh, over the next uh, five to ten years, um, they predicted their price. I'm not going to mention that here because it's not what we do, but uh, take a look into what that report says. But the interesting thing is really what they are talking about. So online transactions, how they look there. As you can see, it's really in detail of what um, they are analyzing and it's worth uh, spending some time into reading this report. It's 64, no, 61 pages. Now, um, part of this is, of course, as you heard from us last uh, or a few weeks ago, is that China is moving into um, the, the Chinese renminbi into uh, cryptocurrency. And Canada is, uh, like most other countries, are planning to do similar things. Uh, the interesting thing is that some experts in Canada are uh, hoping that the Bank of Canada will be, uh, create a more inclusive and accessible um, uh, digital Canadian dollar. So let's hope that that happens because that would be beneficial for everybody in the world. And the last one is uh, uh, Coinbase. Um, they have got a section where you can earn money by just learning something. So you go into coinbase.com and then slash earn. And then you've got here a section where you can just uh, by learning something, uh, earn money. And it's, I think, in total over $400. And they just started this one here, the compound course, uh, where you can earn nine compounds, uh, $9 worth in compound um, uh, by just taking the course. Now, you have to be fast because these things sell out pretty fast. But it's just another way on how you can make small money, but you can make some money. Anyway, um, that's it from me uh, this week. Uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you learned something. And I'm looking forward to see you next week. So thank you very much for watching. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you, Robert. Just a reminder that we're not providing financial advice, but just sharing what's happening in the cryptocurrency market. Always remember that the cryptocurrency market is ever-changing and always volatile, so you should only spend what you can afford to lose. Now, back to Becca in the newsroom. Thank you, Robbie. According to a semi-annual ranking announced by the U.S. European Top 500 Project on Monday, Japan's latest supercomputer, Fugaku, is the world's fastest for computing speed. This is the first time that a Japanese supercomputer has taken the top position in nine years when the K computer, Fugaku's prede predecessor, took first place at this time in 2011. Jointly developed by Japan's state-backed Riken Center for Computational Science and Fujitsu, Fugaku is the first ever ARM-based system to become the world's fastest supercomputer. 
It scored a high-performance Linpack HPL score of 415.5 petaflops, which makes it 2.8 times faster than IBM Summit's 148.6 petaflops, that is now in second place in the top 500 supercomputer rankings. Fugaku is powered by Fujitsu's 48-core ARM-based A64FX system on chip and consists of nearly 7.3 million CPU cores. In single precision operations, it reaches peak performance of over 1,000 petaflops, which pushes our vernacular into the next tier at 1 exaflop. The chips run at 2.0 GHz with a boost to 2.2 GHz and carry 32 GB of second-generation high-bandwidth memory each. This ARM-based supercomputer also secured the number one position in other rankings that test computers on different parameters, including Graph 500, HPL, AI, and high-performance conjugate gradient. This is the first time that a supercomputer has simultaneously topped the rankings in the above four categories, according to Fujitsu. Currently installed at the Riken Center for Computational Science, in Kobe, Japan, Fugaku is, will also carry out a wide range of applications that will address high-priority social and scientific issues. While the supercomputer is expected to start full-time operation in April next year, they are already using it in the fight against COVID-19. In recent years, countries like the U.S. and China have dominated the race to develop powerful machines. This time, too, China dominated the top 500 list with 226 supercomputers, while the U.S. took second place with 114 systems, followed by Japan with 30, France with 18, and Germany with 16 systems. Chinese ride-hailing firm Didi Chuqing says it plans to operate more than a million self-driving vehicles by 2030. According to Didi's chief operating officer, Meng Xing, the robo-taxis are to be deployed in places where ride-hailing drivers are less available. The company last month completed a more than $500 million fundraising round for the autonomous driving unit led by SoftBank Group's Vision Fund 2. Apple, who is known to be interested in the development of autonomous driving, invested $1 billion into DD back in 2016. Last year, Didi said it would start using autonomous vehicles to pick up passengers in Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen this year before expanding the scheme outside China in 2021. Automakers and tech companies in China are investing heavily in the autonomous driving industry to compete with the likes of Tesla, Alphabet, Waymo, and Uber. While some industry insiders say it will take time for the public to trust autonomous vehicles fully, Meng said Didi expects autonomous vehicles to be in mass production by 2025. Competitors are already offering robo-taxi service, but a fleet of one million vehicles would put them all to shame. We'll keep our eye on this and see if Didi is able to deliver. Facebook has created a virtual reality headset that's not much larger than a chunky pair of sunglasses. The futuristic shades use a specially designed holographic film to miniaturize the lens. Conventional VR displays tend to be bulky as the refractive lenses inside of them need a couple of inches to focus the display for its wearer's eyes. The result is a pair of glasses that are most, at most only 9 millimeters thick, according to the researchers, and weigh only 17.8 grams. Images from the glasses' green and black display are frankly extremely cyberpunk. The glasses can provide an approximately 90-degree horizontal field of view, according to testing detailed in a paper published by Facebook Research. The design also does away with the traditional LCD panels used in conventional VR headsets and uses lasers instead to create an image. That means pixel counting isn't really an option. It's still an early prototype with plenty of limitations. Since light rays from the backlight fan out significantly before they are focused by the holographic beam splitter surface, large regions of the display do not contribute to the display's field of view, the researchers write in the paper. The glasses are also still not capable of producing a full color image and exhibit ghosting around the edges of the field of view caused by optical surfaces reflecting light. The team already has a plan to reduce weight even further. By switching to plastic substrates, the researchers expect to bring total weight to just 6.6 .6 grams, about the weight of a pair of large aviator-style sunglasses. 
This news comes at the same time as Google's acquisition of Canadian smart glasses startup North, who developed lightweight focal smart glasses designed with a holographic display that only the user can see. It would appear augmented reality is still in the sights of these two big players, which could mean some interesting tech in the coming years. Big thanks to Roy W. Nash and our community of viewers for submitting stories to us this week. Thanks for watching the Category 5.TV Newsroom. Don't forget to like and subscribe for all your tech news with a slight Linux bias. And if you appreciate what we do, become a patron at patreon.com slash category5. From the Category 5.TV Newsroom, I'm Becca Ferguson. Before we wrap up this week's episode, a message just came in to me from Eduardo. And Eduardo is using a Pinebook Pro, just like me, but is trying to get things working with an SD card for the operating system. Eduardo writes, Hi, I'd like to know if you've used the OS in the card for a long time. I'm facing a problem where the card becomes read-only after 10 days. I've repeated the procedure twice, and I got the same result. I know the wearing problem, but I disabled the swap and Firefox disk cache to reduce the wearing effect. But around 10 days in, the card becomes useless. That again coming to us from Eduardo. It's an unfortunate scenario if that happens, but I'm going to tell you what I suspect is going on. So first of all, in Linux, when an operating system becomes read-only, when a file system becomes read-only. That occurs when the kernel panics when trying to do read-write operations. That usually is a telltale sign of a failing hard drive. Well, you're not using a hard drive, you're using an SD card, a micro SD. So in your case, if you are confident that your micro SD card is good, no defects, if you are confident that your SD card is not a fake, because they exist. So please, if this is a new card, get onto our website, category5.tv, or even linuxtechshow.com, and just do a quick search through our videos for fake SD card. And I've got some tools there that'll help you to be able to determine if your SD card is fake. Because then what happens is you get to a certain uh, point on the file system where it tries to write to areas of the card that don't actually exist because it's fake, and then it will crap out and you're going to go into that read-only state. Um, so that's a possibility. But if you are confident that it's a good card and you're pretty sure, um, and you're absolutely certain that it's not a fake, because that would definitely provide this symptom, just try a different brand. Try a different card. Try a different speed Get into the community at pine64.org. Find out what other people are using. I've had great success with some Kingston cards, and I've had some failures with some Kingston cards. I've had great success with some SanDisk cards, and I've had some failures uh, in turn with some SanDisk cards. So from card to card, there are various things that will cause this to happen because that Pinebook Pro is trying to use it like it's a hard drive, and some cards may be problematic, whereas another card will be perfectly fine. So try a different card, try a different brand, a different, um, a different um, card within their lineup even, and see what, uh, what works best for you. To straight outright answer your question, Eduardo, I have used uh, my micro SD card ever since I got my Pinebook Pro. And um, I have had no such um, happenstance. Now, I'm not a heavy power user on my Pinebook Pro. Generally speaking, it stays in the studio when I'm not here. And, uh, and then I fire it up on a Wednesday night to do the show. Um, but there are times when I take it home and I do full production and stuff. But, and I'm using it um, like over the weekends and things like that. But um, so I think from card to card, you just got to try and see what, uh, what the next card behaves like. Um, but understand that that is what's causing it, is that it's having trouble with that card. So if you've then 
rewritten the same card and tried again, you're still experiencing the same symptom because it's the same card. Or if it's the same brand and same product line, maybe there's a problem with that. So again, getting into the community and finding out what other people are suggesting will do you some good. Thank you for the question. All right, folks. Well, we've got uh, we've got to wrap up for the week. It's been fantastic having you here. Do check out our series at cat5.tv slash microtick. Check out um, the newsroom, the crypto corner, and all of these clips at linuxtechshow.com. Or, of course, everything comes together on our website, category5.tv. You can follow category5tv on Twitter. And I personally am even more awesome on Twitter uh, at... Robbie Ferguson, uh, because I follow back. So if you want an extra follower, follow me. And incidentally, I post things like Doctor Who. I say that because I had a, a tweet that I posted <laughs> this week and BBC retweeted it and it was just mind bending from there. So um, get over to twitter.com slash Robbie Ferguson. Give me a follow and I'll follow you back. All right. Have a wonderful week, everybody. I will see you again next time. Oh, don't forget, we do have a coffee break this Sunday at 12 o'clock noon Eastern time. So get onto our website, category5.tv, scroll down on the homepage, you'll see the coffee break and participate in that Zoom meeting where our community comes together and just has a coffee and a chat. So we'll see you there. Take it easy, everybody. See ya. Thank you.